Uh, this morning, we have something very special. We're going to be coming to the Lord's table. We're remembering the covenant that Jesus has made with us in the new covenant. And uh, we want to prepare ourselves to come and participate uh, in this sacramental meal, because in this meal, we actually receive grace, the grace of Jesus. And um, so we're going to ask Jesus to be our teacher. Would you pray with me? Father, we uh, need to hear from you. We've been able to sing your praises. We've offered up prayers to you. We've confessed our sin. And now, God, we, we take time in our worship to study, and, and we ask that you would speak to us. You would convict us where necessary. You would encourage us, God, like only you are able to encourage us where necessary. And we, so we give this time to you. Make us attentive. Help us to learn. Uh, and in all of this, we pray it for the glory of and for the sake of Jesus, our King. Amen? Well, we uh, are in a series right now where we've been asking the question, how big is your God? It's a loaded question. How you answer that has all kinds of implications. Over the last couple of weeks, we've said that God is big enough to deal with our challenges. We looked at the life of Gideon. We saw that Gideon had many challenges. They were called Midianites. And uh, God enabled Gideon to do what he needed to do in the midst of his challenges. We, then uh, the following week after that, we talked about the fact that God is strong enough to help us in our weaknesses. And we looked at Deborah and found inspiration from her being made by God, both a prophet and a judge in Israel. And we saw how God used her uh, in her circumstances. Last week, we talked about the Shema. And uh, that's a passage of scripture uh, in the Old Testament that's vitally important to the nation of Israel. And we saw that God is an all-wise God. He's big enough to give us wisdom in the midst of our confusion. And if we're being honest, there's a lot of time where we're a little bit confused. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I go there? Should I go here? What have you? God is a God who is big enough to guide us in our confusion. This morning, I want to talk about the fact that God is big enough to even overcome our sin. Well, that sounds like a whole hummer, doesn't it? Go ahead, you can admit it. Sounds like a whole hummer, doesn't it? But it's actually not. God is big enough to overcome even our sin. You know, whether you know it or not, sin is your biggest problem. Sin is what messes up your relationships. Sin is what makes other people so hard to get along with, jab, jab. Sin is what makes uh, the world such a dangerous place to live in. Sin is what causes people to be greedy. Sin is what causes us not to care as long as it's someone else who's suffering and not me. Sin is what makes one group of people hate another group of people. Sin is what causes us to break our promises to each other. Sin is what causes us to say hurtful, even awful things to the people we love. Sin is what starts wars, pits one nation against another nation. Sin is at the bottom of every problem that you and I have. So the obvious question why don't we stop sinning? Duh, why don't we stop sinning? Why not just be good? Well, the obvious answer, we can't. We simply can't. Here's a little experiment. Just try this one on. Try for one day, just one day, 24 hours not to sin. If you're married, let your spouse be the referee on this, okay? Let them tell you. I mean, try not to care about yourself more than you do others. Just try one day. Try not to think nasty thoughts. Try not to think uh, angry thoughts at someone who's a moron. <laughs> try not to judge others just for one day. Uh, try not to lie. You know, last week I referred to a study that they found uh, that 91% of the people they surveyed admitted that they lie routinely, regularly, if it serves their purpose. So just try, try not to lie for 24 hours. You get the idea. Sin is the biggest problem you have and you have no solution for it. Ah, there's another problem. You have no solution for your sin. You cannot stop sinning. Neither can I, neither could the apostle Paul. The apostle Paul said one time these words, he says, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, that's honesty right there. Paul is telling the truth. 
You see, that is our biggest problem, spiritually, emotionally, physically, socially, you name it, hands down, our biggest problem is sin. Now, some people don't believe that. I was talking to someone this summer that doesn't believe there is such a thing as sin because they don't believe there's any such thing as moral absolutes. And, you know, that's not terribly surprising. You know, the Bible actually says that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? So the heart, our heart will tell us that either we don't sin, there's no such thing as sin, or we sin way less than everybody else. So, you know, we're not so bad. One of the consequences of sin in our lives is that generally we are best at identifying sin in others. I see your sins clearly, my own, not so much. Jesus noticed that this was a huge problem in his day, especially for people who were devoutly religious, oddly enough. Devoutly religious people often have strict codes of behavior. Uh, They follow some strict disciplines in their life. They have rules to follow and these things help them kind of be pure, stay on track, be the person they want to be, stay on the right path. These things help them maintain and improve their their own goodness. This morning, I wanna look at a passage. It's in Luke chapter 18. This is a passage where Jesus tells a story, a parable, if you will. It's only six verses long. It's a fascinating story because Luke does something at the beginning of the story that he doesn't always do. In fact, rarely does. Uh, he, He starts the story by telling us why Jesus tells this story. It's kind of a behind the scenes footnote, actually. So what we'll do is we'll read this passage together. You follow along and I'll read it out loud. Then we'll spend some time trying to understand it and trying to apply it. Sound good? Okay. Luke 18, verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, As I said, this is really an interesting story. It's a short story, six verses long. And Jesus tells it on purpose, we're told, because he knew there were some people listening who didn't understand that they had a serious sin problem. And they didn't understand that they couldn't fix it. No amount of trying, no amount of effort, no amount of code keeping would root out the problem of sin. And they didn't understand that. In fact, they were thinking that they were doing pretty good at overcoming their own sin, at least way better than everybody else that they noticed, you know, that whole comparing thing. And consequently, they figured, you know, God must be pretty proud of me, even thankful to have me on the team. I'm a hard worker on the team. You see, these people were not shirkers. They were not slackers. They were bootstrappers, you know, that whole idea. They were going to get it done religiously showing others what it looked like to live a righteous life. Now, when Jesus starts telling this story, all of the listeners are familiar with this form of story that Jesus is telling. There's going to be two characters. There's going to be a good guy and there's going to be a bad guy. And so when Jesus starts off the story by saying two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector, they're right with him. They know exactly where this is going. It's the traditional formula for stories like this. The first character would be the good guy. This would be the Pharisee, the devout Jew, the observer of the law, the Torah. The second guy would be the bad guy, the tax collector, the breaker of the law, the traitor to the nation, if you will. As many of you know, in those days of Roman occupation, when Jesus was uh, there on, here on the planet, um, the Romans would often employ nationals, Jews, um, to do certain tasks, tasks like that of being a tax collector. And uh, people like this would become uh, collaborators with the, the Roman Empire. 
As you can imagine, sometimes these were dubious people, people willing to accept Roman occupation, people willing to work with the Romans, people willing, even excited about getting rich at the expense of their fellow Jews in this case. And so at the outset of Jesus' story, people have certain expectations. They've identified the good guy, Pharisee, the bad guy, the tax collector. But Jesus is going to surprise them with this contrast between the Pharisee and the tax collector. And so he sets up a contrast describing their posture and describing their prayer. And he starts off by saying these two characters both go up to the Temple Mount. The temple was on the highest point, an elevated place in the city of Jerusalem. You, have to, you had to then, you still have to walk up to the, where the temple was, uh, the temple mount. That's where public worship would take place. And again, this is public worship, not private prayer time. This is like being here in worship. When we pray together here, we pray out loud. Everybody uh, gets to hear, everybody gets to participate. And so there are people all around. Uh, this is what devout Jews did in Jerusalem. In fact, three different times during the day at each of these times, there would have been certainly hundreds, maybe even thousands of people in the courtyard there at the temple. These would be gathered worshipers. And while they were gathered, the priest would have sacrificed a lamb as a symbol of the atonement of the payment for sins for the people. And this was integral to the Jewish worship. This was something they did every single day, three times a day. And uh, then after the sacrifice had been offered on behalf of the people for their sins, the priest would then go into the holy place. That was that, that first room there in the tabernacle, there in the temple. And uh, this is not the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, but the holy place. This is where the table of showbread was. That was a reminder to the people that God had always provided for them. This is where the menorah was, the light, the seven uh, candle uh, dumahickey thing, you know, with the lights on it stuff. Um, that's all, that's Hebrew, that's seminary talk, sorry. Um, also in there was the altar of incense, which the priest would, would light incense. It was, a, it was a visual picture of the prayers of God's people rising up to God himself in worship. Um, and it was in that context that the Pharisee stands up to pray. All this is going on, he stands up to pray. And Jesus says the Pharisee stood by himself and pray. You know, there are five lines in the prayer of the Pharisee. There's only two lines in the prayer of the tax collector. And the Pharisee prays, God, I thank you. It's good so far. He should have stopped right there is what he should have done. But he goes on to say that I'm not like other people. This comparison thing. You know, other people, God, the rest of the people gathered around here, the robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers. See, that was his list of sins that, that he thought of, that he gravitated towards when it came to comparing or evaluating himself, maybe because he didn't struggle with those sins so much. I know that's what I like to do. If I'm comparing myself to others, I like to compare my strengths to your weaknesses. That way I look better. Perhaps these sins were safe sins for him to mention, areas where he didn't struggle, but he, he doesn't stop there. He goes on, he says, not only am I not like these people gathered here, I'm also not like this guy right here, this, this tax collector. And that's kind of how I pictured. I don't know if he was pointing, but you know, I wouldn't, have been, I wouldn't be one bit surprised if he was pointing like this guy, the tax collector, right? He singles him out. You see, this guy's the perfect contrast to the Pharisee. This guy has given in to Roman occupation. This guy has decided to cooperate with them, even probably profit from them. This guy is just one huge compromise of religious piety and national pride. So he's saying, not me, God. I am not like this guy. I take my religion seriously. How seriously? Well, here's the thing. He's going to tell God how seriously he takes his religion. In case you haven't noticed, God, not only am I not like everybody else gathered here, I fast twice a week, he says. He's pretty proud of this. It's the first thing he mentions to kind of recommend himself to God, to get God's attention. Now, the interesting thing is Moses in the Old Testament made it a requirement that one day a year on the day of atonement, everybody would fast. Everybody would go without food for that day. This was to prepare them, to remind them of their utter and absolute need for God to do something about their sin. Sin for a Jew was covenant unfaithfulness, 
God had made promises to them. God had made a pact with them. God had entered into a very personal relationship with them. And there were certain things they were supposed to do and not do and what have you. And the truth be told, every single day they were breaking that pact. Every single day they were sinning against God. Something needed to be done. And so built into the worship of Israel on an annual basis, there was this thing called the Day of Atonement. It was a hugely special, important day in the calendar of a Jew, of an Israelite. They were to fast and they were to remember that God would save them. God would rescue them just like he had always done. God would forgive their sins. He would accept the sacrifice. He would let a lamb suffer death instead of them suffering death because of their sin. And that's how serious sin actually is, friends. I mean, spiritually speaking, sin is deadly. You see, because of their sin, they were spiritually dead. Because of their sin, they were separated from God. They were guilty of violating his laws. They were guilty of violating his love. They were guilty of violating his faithfulness to them. But in the annual sacrifice, you see, God's, uh, God would mercifully take the punishment that they deserved and put it onto a sacrificial lamb. That's what was going on. God did that in mercy. That was a completely undeserved gift. That sacrifice opened the way for them to have a relationship with God again. It made it possible for them to pray and God would hear them. It made it possible for them to sin, something they couldn't stop doing, but they had somewhere to go with that sin and then they could draw near to God. But here's the tragedy. This Pharisee in Jesus' story, he wasn't really fasting to remember God's forgiveness or God's mercy. He was fasting to demonstrate what he thought was his own righteousness, his own goodness, his own acceptability before God. He and other Jews like him had in effect created a, a religion built on the back of the Mosaic law, the laws given through Moses. And this religion was based on the idea of keeping the rules. It was just that simple. Keep the rules and God will like you. They had taken the law that Moses had given them, the Torah, and they had added layer upon layer upon layer of interpretation and regulations about how to keep that law. And scholars in these matters tell us today that there are as many as 600 additional rules and regulations that were added. These are by rabbis and teachers of the law over the centuries, right? And these additional regulations were supposed to assist you in keeping the Torah, keeping the law. If you kept these regulations, you'd get nowhere near breaking the law was the idea. Now, devout Jews even today follow these rules and regulations. Just to give you a feel for this, uh, I want to read something from a website. The website is called askmoses.com. Had no idea Moses was around or available, but he is. Uh, it's a site dedicated to helping Jews today obey the Torah because devout Jews want to obey the law, right? And uh, this is according to the Mishnah and the Halakha. These are writings of uh, ancient Jews where they would write about the Torah and how do we keep it and what does it mean to keep this, this uh, Mosaic law and so on. The question that I looked up on this site was this question. How far am I allowed to walk on the Sabbath? That was the question that I looked up. And I'm just gonna quote the answer back to you and you can wrestle through this and see how it sits. How far am I allowed to walk on the Sabbath? Well, because driving, biking, blading, skateboarding, and other device-driven means of transportation are prohibited on the Shabbat, and of course they would be because they're fun, uh, we walk rather than commute to synagogue. However, even walking on Shabbat has its limits. Jewish law sets the maximum walking range from one city to 2,000 cubits. That's 3,049 and a half feet, right? Or that's 0.596 miles, or that's 960 meters. However, this measurement starts at 70 and two thirds cubits. That's 112.24 feet from the city limits. So practically speaking, this means that you may not walk a straight line more than 0.598 miles or 3,161.74 feet in any direction uh, outside of your city limits, okay? 
It goes on, it says, city limits are not defined by the map you carry in your glove compartment. According to Halakha, you know, Jewish writing, Jewish teaching, uh, unless there is more than 70 and two thirds cubits, that's 112.24 feet. Unless there is more than 70 and two thirds cubits between one house and the next, all contiguous housing is considered to be part of the same city. Therefore, at times it would be permitted to walk from one city to the next, like walking from Littleton to Lakewood, you see, as long as the whole way is populated. That's the key. This can be complex and a rabbi should be consulted before planning a long trek on Shabbat. You got that? You see how this works? That's some serious regulation going on there. You see, they are serious and no laughing matter. They're serious about keeping Torah. In this case, observing the Shabbat, the Sabbath. And so they, they built a religious system around the Mosaic law that they thought would enable them to keep the Mosaic law. They became this, this whole practice of, of obeying and following these regulations became everything to a devout Jew, to someone like a Pharisee. They were in effect, Pharisees were in effect, highly, highly educated, dedicated, professional rule keepers. That's what they were. And many of them were very proud of their rule keeping and the fact that it went way beyond the stipulations of the Mosaic law. See, this Pharisee in our story is a perfect example. He is actually reminding God that he fasts how many times a week? Two times a week, not once a year. Two times a week. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter six warns the people against the Pharisees' practice of fasting in the marketplace to be seen by people. Uh, they would put ashes on their face so that you would know something was different, something was wrong, something was going on. They would wear torn clothing and they would head out into the marketplace and do in a public area, a public arena so that everybody could see and go, wow, wow, look at Bob, man. He must, he, is he fasting again? This will be the second time this week. I mean, that's what they wanted people to see and wanted people to know. All the while the Pharisees that are doing this would go about pretending like it wasn't a show. Pretending they were doing this because they just, they just loved God and loved Torah and wanted to keep the law. But Jesus knew better. And so Jesus tells this story. And he says, this kind of thing really bothers God. God doesn't like religion on display. In fact, Jesus says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. In other words, the only reward you're gonna get is the fact that people see you doing it. That's it, period. No more reward, not from your father in heaven. God is not impressed with and will not reward religion on display. Now, Jesus mentions a, another thing, a third part of the Pharisee's prayer. The Pharisee says, God, I need to let you know, I give a tenth of all I get. That's what he says. I don't know if he said it that way, but that's, that's what he meant. Of all I get. And now at first blush, we read that and it simply looks like he's saying he tithes. That's something many of us do. We do that gladly. It's just a part of our worship. It's a part of our obedience. We're, we're acknowledged that everything we have, God gave to us and we want to advance the kingdom. That's one way we do it. So no big deal. It's a tithe. But the way Jesus phrases this, he's indicating that what the Pharisee is saying is he does more than just tithe. He goes way beyond the Mosaic law, the Torah what it demands. You see, in the Torah, you would read this, that you are to tithe of your grain, your wine, your oil, the crops, and your cattle, those things. But he says, I'm giving a tenth on all I get or all I have, every little thing that comes my way. It's interesting, interesting, Jesus comments on this kind of thing later on in Matthew 23. Again, he's very critical of religion on display, very critical. He says, you Pharisees take, you, you have taken your kitchen herb gardens, right? 
your kitchen herb gardens, and you give a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, your cumin. Uh, this would be like you going home and ram, or, you know, kind of uh, rampaging through the cabinets and getting all your spices out and kind of measuring and getting a tenth of them and put them in a baggie and bring them here to church and put them in the bag. And yeah, we don't want that. That would be bad. That'd probably wind up being my job to sort all that out. I, you know, you, you can kind of see how silly this becomes. And Jesus goes on to say, he says, you've done that. That's a little silly. You've done that. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law. And then he mentions some things. They're all relational things. They're all things about people, not garden herbs. Uh, he says, you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter, tithing. Sure, that's one way to honor God and obey, but without neglecting the former, right? You tithe on your herb garden, but you refuse to do what God desires most. You see, here's the thing. If you love God, you don't get a pass on loving people. They're absolutely hand in hand. And therefore you have to show mercy. People need mercy. We all need mercy. You have to love justice. Sometimes people need justice. They need help. You have to help them. And you have to be faithful as you relate to other people. This Pharisee, when he was praying, he was kind of praying about himself is what he was doing. He was saying to God, look at me, I have kept, I have not only kept, I've even exceeded the requirements of the law, unlike all the rest of these people. And oh yeah, this guy in particular, the tax collector. That's what he's really saying. You see, he shows no mercy. He shows no justice. In fact, his attitude is one of condemnation as he looks around him. And unfortunately, I don't need to tell you this, you know, the church sometimes gets a reputation of being a condemning body. And it's, it's because a lot of times we go about criticizing and pointing out the flaws and the, the sins of others without embracing the fact that, boy, we're in the same boat. We wrestle with the same sins, the same problems here. And we, we condemn. You know, it's apparent in this story that the Pharisee really didn't come to pray. He actually came to inform God and other people just how good he was, right? He didn't really come for the sacrifice that everybody else was there because they were in desperate need of the sacrifice. He was in effect saying, you know, yeah, that blood on the altar over there, that sacrifice over there, I don't really need that. Not, not too much. His personal view of sin was that he didn't sin that much. That was his view of sin. And I got to tell you, that kind of thinking, that kind of attitude, what that always, always does is it shrinks our awareness of our desperate need of God. That diminishes our thankfulness. It diminishes our appreciation of the sacrifice that God provided. You see, God for this Pharisee was more, of a, was more of a referee than he was a savior. He was making the call, you're good, you're not, you know. That's how this Pharisee saw our God. This man, this Pharisee didn't understand the enormity of his own sin and the awful repercussions of it. And so it's here where the story kind of takes an unexpected turn. And before we follow that turn, let me, let me just kind of, mention something on it as an aside. It's fascinating to me that as I was working on this message, the thought occurred to me that some of you really need to hear this message. <laughs> some of your names came to mind. Some of you right here, right now. And isn't that amazing, really? I can be writing a sermon about the magnitude of sin and its devastating consequences in our lives, not even be thinking of my own sin. I can be thinking of yours. Jeremiah was right. The heart is deceitful above all things. It's beyond cure. Who can understand it? 
You see, God is incredibly patient with me. I'm a lot like the Pharisee. And as I said, it's right here where the story takes an unexpected turn. Jesus says, you've seen the Pharisee. Everybody's actually, I think at this point in the story, a little nervous. They're a little nervous. Remember, these people standing around, uh, they're just sinners. They're just ordinary people. They know it. And guys like Pharisees tend to make them nervous, quite nervous, because they know they can't do the Pharisee thing, right? They will never be as good a rule or law keeper as the Pharisees. The Pharisees are professionals at this. But it's clear to them that Jesus' story is not featuring the Pharisee as the hero, right? So what exactly is Jesus doing? I'm guessing it made them a little nervous. And then Jesus says, but the tax collector. (laughs) And just by saying that, he gives away who the hero is. Like the Pharisee, you see, the tax collector stands to pray, but he prays at a distance, we're told. This, this, is, this is not about public display at this point, right? That's what's going on. Luke is pretty clear that this distance thing was based on a humility of spirit. This man's humility is based on the reality of his own sin. His sins were not theoretical. He knew what they were. He was ashamed before God because of what he had done. And so he stood far off. It says, not even looking up to heaven, he felt unworthy. And so he kept his distance from the other worshipers. And not just that, we're told too that he even beat his breast, his chest, right? This behavior sounds weird, strange, melodramatic to us. But in the Middle East, this was a cultural expression of just extreme anguish, this beating of the chest. And here it most likely meant to indicate that he knew where his problem was. It's right here. It's deeply rooted in his heart. Now, Jesus never tells us what this man's sins were. We know one of them was he voted for the wrong political party, (laughs) right? He voted for the Romans. And boy, if you're an evangelical, you know you better vote for the right party, right? The trouble is just deciding which one is right or if they're not just all wrong, I'm not sure. But he had committed that sin. Who knows what else he did? And this gesture, you know, him beating himself on the chest reflects the fact, the fact that, that he knew. <laughs> this guy knew the truth about himself. He understood that his sin problem was enormous. It was rooted in him so deeply, he could not fix it himself. He could not improve himself. He had a serious heart problem that affected everything he did, even his worship, even his worship. Any of you ever been, you know, gosh, we're having a moment and Aaron's up here singing and the band's just, oh man, you're, you're into it and you're singing and wow, you're just praising God. And all of a sudden you're thinking, I sound pretty good. I wonder if anybody else can hear me. (laughs) I ought to have a dang microphone in my hand, you know. And suddenly, for a moment, becomes all about you. Has that happened to any of you? Or just to Holly, my wife? (laughs) Yeah. Ooh, ooh, I didn't like the sound of that. (laughs) You see, this guy knew he couldn't even get that right. Couldn't even get worship right. Well, this tax collector does the right thing. He doesn't pretend. He cries out to God. He's he's not going to pretend that he's somebody that he's not. He cries out and he says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He appeals to the only one he can appeal to for mercy, and that's God. He wants the sacrifice that the priest has just 
offered. He wants that sacrifice to atone for him, to pay for his sin. You see, where the Pharisee was distancing himself from even the need for a sacrifice, the tax collector is saying, oh God, please let this sacrifice be for me. Let it be true that this sacrifice might be enough to cover my sins. And so he pants, you know, I mean, he, he really pants for the forgiveness of God. He pants for the deliverance of God. He pants for the mercy of God. He's doing what the psalmist says when he says that as the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. That's what the tax collector's doing here. That's what this is all about. Now, the ironic thing about his posture and his prayer is this. His posture and his prayer make it clear that he understands his sin is enormous. And he is helpless in the face of it. And it's that very thing that allows him to appreciate how enormously big his God is. You see, God is so big. He's big enough to forgive him. He's big enough to show him mercy. He's big enough to let him live in the freedom and joy that comes from knowing Jesus and not to live in guilt and shame. You see, Jesus says, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God. All those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. That's the, that is the upside down nature of the kingdom of Jesus. That kingdom where Jesus reigns. It's so ironic. The one who sees his sin, the one who sees his failure, the one who knows his own deceitful heart sees the enormity of his sin, turns to God for forgiveness, and it's that person that God will forgive. It's that person that God does save. It's that person that God wholly justifies. It's that person that does see the enormity of who God is. There's an English Puritan, his name is Thomas Merton, Uh, He observed around this subject the following. He said, there's no greater disaster in spiritual life than to be immersed in unreality. That is about who you are, who God is. For life is maintained and nourished in us by our vital relationship with reality. You see, reality is that our sins are killing us every day. They are the biggest problem we have. And we can't, despite all our efforts, even stop sinning. Just try it for a day. And until we know this and come to appreciate that that is our sad reality, so that we are in great need and see that we are in great need of God's rescue and God's provision and God's salvation, until we are clear about this, we won't really appreciate what's displayed right here on this table the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the unmitigated grace of God. I love what Martin Luther wrote to his friend Melanchthon. His friend Melanchthon was a kind of timid guy, not very forceful or not even necessarily that outgoing. Martin Luther wrote to Melanchthon at one point, he said, if you're a preacher of grace, then preach a true and not a fictitious grace. And if grace is true, You must bear true and not a fictitious sin. Sometimes church communities can be communities that kind of, you know, want to pretend like our sins just aren't what they really are. Fictitious sin, you know. But he says, you must bear a true and not a fictitious sin. God does not save people who are only fictitious sinners. Be a sinner and sin boldly, Martin Luther said. What he means by that is own it. You did it, own it. Don't hide it. Don't pretend. You sinned for crying out loud. What are you going to do? Well, he says, believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly. There's your answer. For he is victorious over sin, death, and the world. So folks, you see, there can be no pretending. When we come to this table, there can be no pretending. It's a table of grace. It's a table hosted by Jesus. Four sinners, no one else. 
If we diminish our sin, if we call it something it isn't, if we rationalize it, if we excuse it, if we try to make it less than it is, we diminish the sacrifice that's represented right here in the death of Jesus Christ. So we want to come to this table, this sacrament of the Lord's Supper, the same way the tax collector came to the temple. Oh, God, please let this sacrifice be for me. Let it be true that this sacrifice might cover my sin. God, have mercy on me, a sinner, you see. And when we come with that kind of honesty and that kind of openness and that kind of dependence, we know that we are, we will be justified by what Jesus did for us. We are forgiven. We are loved. We are saved. Because Jesus says so. You know, it was John the Baptist um, who first publicly uh, made a statement. It's, it's so uh, interesting. I don't know if John the Baptist fully uh, understood what he was saying when he said it. He saw Jesus coming to him one time. This is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. And he said, he said look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How did John know that Jesus was the Lamb of God. How did John know that Jesus was going to be the slain Lamb who would take away the sins of the world? I'm pretty sure John didn't know that Jesus had come to die on a cross. Not at that point. I I mean, John's words are remarkable. That that early in the ministry of Jesus, someone could say, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And what's so interesting is, Jesus did do that, but he didn't do that by organizing all of us into very highly disciplined communities who could keep the law of God. He didn't do that by showing us the ropes and enabling us to get better at religion. Jesus took away the sins of the world, our sins, my sin and your sin, by dying for us by taking my punishment and your punishment on himself, giving us his righteousness. In other words, he he did what he did at a very, very, very high price, the price of his own life. You know, here at uh, Deer Creek, we, we invite you to partake of this meal with us if you have faith in Jesus. That's the prerequisite. You need to know Jesus as your Savior. You need to have come to him at some point and, and said, Jesus, I can't, I can't do, I can't fix myself. The sin that's in me, I, I, I can't just by trying get better. Would you forgive me? I put my faith in you. I trust in you. And if you've done that, we invite you to partake with us in this meal. Um, This is a meal, of course, that represents the body and the blood of Jesus. In our trays, we have, uh, it's it's grape juice. There's there's no wine. This is just juice. So for those of you that need juice, you can rest assured you can grab any cup. Um, Jesus, when he was in the upper room with his disciples, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread is my body broken for you. Now, the way we're going to partake this morning is uh, we're going to hand these out to you. And when you have them, uh, you'll hold on to them because we're going to partake together like a family, you know, around it. We're all going to drink together at the same time. I'll tell you when to do that. And there's something else uh, we could do uh, as we hand out these elements if you want. You don't have to do this. But when you hand the tray to the person next to you, um, if it's the bread... That'll come first. You can say, the body of Jesus broken for you. Or Jesus' body broken for you. It's just a gracious thing to say. Just a little reminder. Um, First, we want to pray and set these elements apart for their special purpose. Then we'll have the ushers come forward and we'll eat of this meal that Jesus hosts. Pray with me. Father, thank you that we can gather in this room, worship, Remember what Jesus has done. 
Remember that there is a solution to our greatest problem, the problem of sin. Would you forgive us? Would you fill us with your spirit? Would you make us more like Jesus? Be merciful to us, Lord, all of us who are sinners. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.